Hello and welcome to this review of my KPT, KPT84. I got this brand new for just 9 euros off of someone a while ago, but there was one catch, most of the keycaps have been taken off for use on someone else's project presumably. Luckily the really weird keys such as these, and these, and these, and these were all still left on the board, and I was able to replace the missing keys successfully. But the spacebar is of a rather strange type and wasn't stabilized compatible with any of the spacebars I had of this size. So I had to use a slightly smaller one. Not the end of the world though. I'm pretty sure it had seen no or negligible use before I got it, like the seller said, because it was absolutely spotlessly clean. But despite that, a few keys don't work, unfortunately. They are print screen, pause, home, the up key, and insert and delete. It's probably due to the rather shoddy quality of the soldering, which is very uneven and quite badly done. I mean, look at this for example. Really, really doesn't give the impression of a quality product. Some of these don't look like they're making contact with anything at all. Also, none of these large keys at the left here, including the shift key, are stabilized, so they work very badly. Regardless, I always like to own new old stock keyboards, and this even came with the original dust cover. Besides, I wanted to review the switches in this for a while, so I think it was 9 euros well spent. By the way, here's the model sticker of the keyboard, showing the serial number, which is quite low at 3559, so it could be that this one is one of the first ones made. The layout is what's known as a 75% layout, even though it has 84 keys on it, hence the name KPT84. It's a quite compact layout that's often found on laptops, and although it's quite small, it has a fairly high number of buttons. It's basically a 10 keyless keyboard, compacted to be one unit taller and one unit longer than a 60% layout, but with many more buttons, which they did by using very small buttons that they all jammed together like this. That does mean that some of the keys are in a slightly different place, like insert and delete here at the bottom, and a nav cluster vertically here, and a split, tiny right shift here. But at least the keys are actually there, and apart from the numpad, you've basically got a full keyboard in a very small package. If you use a USB numpad, you'd end up with a quite small full-size keyboard. As some of you might know, I'm not a huge fan of space-saving layouts, but as far as they go, this is quite a lot in quite a small package. It even has a focus layout, a big-ass enter with a full-size backspace and a split right shift, which is quite useful in my opinion. The keyboard is very light, it's just a piece of plastic, including the mounting plate, which is also plastic. It only weighs about 600 grams, so it's fairly light. Because of the light weight, it doesn't feel very sturdy, and it moves around a fair bit while you're working on it. I'd say it looks fairly modern and not that old at all, but it's from 1993 or maybe 1994. And curiously, it still uses the old 5-pin DIN plug, and it's even ATXT switchable, which is fairly bizarre. I'm sure this is the youngest keyboard I have that's still XT compatible, despite the XT having been superseded for about 10 years by this time. So, if you want to run your ancient IBM PC with a keyboard that's much worse than the fantastic keyboard it originally came with, then the KPT is the one to turn to. An interesting feature is that the indicator lights are all different colors. The power light is red, caps lock is yellow, and scroll lock is green. Obviously, there's no num lock key because there's no numpad. But one strange thing they did is make this little ridge here and the LEDs are sunk very deeply into it. So if you've got the keyboard here and you're typing, you can barely even see the lock lights, which is really weird. It uses KPT switches, which could come with yellow or blue sliders of two different shapes, but I'm not sure how different they actually are. They're all clicky switches and at least superficially they feel pretty much the same to me. Although I'd need full keyboards of the other switch types as well in order to be completely sure of that. KPT switches look a little bit like Alps switches and indeed they're Alps mounts. But they're actually a ripoff of Omron switches and they use the same 3 pin pinout. Omron switches themselves are obviously based on Alps with a similar click leaf. 
and even a real switchblade, but they're different enough that people generally don't consider them Alps clones. Omrons are quite interesting switches and very fun to use and extremely clicky, but they do have their own disadvantages. Check out the reviews of my Chaconi with Amber Omrons and Focus with Cyan ones for more details. KPTs are similar to Omrons and again they use an Alps style click leaf, but unlike Omrons and Alps switches, they don't use switch plates but just bare metal contacts and the sound is different from the unique sound of Omrons as well. They feel very clunky, very tactile and not really scratchy but uneven and they feel stiff and overall fairly unpleasant. Because of the clunky feel and the heavy weighting of some of the switches, you end up really smashing the keys after you used it for a while because that's the only way you know you can make it work. And even then sometimes one of the keys hangs or doesn't register properly. I'd say they are complex to describe, but that's not actually true because I know exactly what they feel like. They feel just like white alp switches that have gone through a huge amount of use. This is my NTC with white alps that I reviewed ages ago. They feel almost exactly the same as the KPTs. Clunky and uncharacteristically stiff. These white alps aren't dirty or anything, just used to fuck. In the NTC review, that didn't really matter because I had already reviewed a White Alps board in excellent condition, so I knew these switches weren't representative, but this KPT keyboard is pristine. So I can only conclude that new KPT switches feel as bad as overused Alps. God knows what the KPT switches feel like after some heavy abuse. They also don't sound as bassy as Alps or as interesting as Omron's. Slightly related to Omron's, but not quite the same, which means there's really very little reason to go for these switches. The keycaps, or at least a few original keycaps still left on the board, look pretty good. They're thin, double shot ABS, and they appear to be made by Tai Hao, which coincidentally is the same manufacturer that made the keycaps for the NTC I just showed. And it's borrowing the NTC's keycaps, by the way, so. Fortunately, the sets don't look too different and blend together quite well. So both sets are the same thin double shot ABS and they're pretty nice quality. I've always liked these caps, especially on smaller boards like this. The caps tend to be meh-ish, but these ones look really good. Like I said, the larger keys except for the space bar and the enter key aren't stabilized, so they bind very badly on off-center key presses especially the left shift, which if you press it at a bad angle, either won't work or it can even get stuck. Thanks KPT, that's a really good idea you had there. Concluding, this keyboard has its pros, including a layout that's quite practical for its size and nice keycaps, but the switches are really not that good. The board is built shoddily and obviously to a cost and the lack of stabilizers is pretty inexcusable, so I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I've seen much worse, and I actually still prefer these switches to Cherry ML, such as in this G84 I reviewed a while ago, but I'd still say most of this keyboard is under par. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.